Thank you all for coming to the event, getting started in a new space. Our goal is to provide you with information from a real estate and design perspective. Whether you're looking to move into a space tomorrow or years from now, or really just kind of work to enhance the space that you're in, um, we think we can provide you with some really great resources. So my name is Lauren Snowden. I work for Herman Miller, and uh, we do have some brochures. We have great use catalogs with some of our product in it. But really, if you want to know what Herman Miller is, you simply have to tour Capital Factory because they're sitting in one of our most popular workstations, especially with like a tech community. It's called Resolve. Um, they love it. A few of the members are also sitting in our air on chair, which is our most iconic, famous chair. And of course, you see the Mira 2s that we had the panelists in this morning. And these were voted like best task chair by Wired Magazine. So we're really proud of that. Um, I, I really want to just get started by introducing the uh, great panelists that we have for you here. I'll start with Haley Berry with ECR. Haley, you want to talk to me about ECR a little bit? Yeah, sure. So um, I specialize in office tenant representation. Um, so I help represent tenants like startups, um, whether that be in a new lease, expanding, subleasing, you name it. Um, I do it and I help negotiate those leases. Um, ECR is a local firm. We actually office right across the street at the Perry Brooks building. Um, we're a local firm and um, been around about five years. Yeah, thanks. And Haley and I are also, we happen to be working with one startup mm -hmm. who was experiencing some growth and they're in the process of leasing space in the Littlefield building, so only you know, a block away. Um, so we're really excited to be working with them. And also we have James Haddon here from the Bomberito Group. James, you want to talk about Bomberito? Sure, we're an interior architecture firm here in town. Uh, been around about 30 years. We specialize in tenant fit out. Uh, I happen to try to work with as many tech companies as I can. I really like to be able to do the creative fun things that, that tech companies like to do. Uh, our, our goal as a company is to create space that doesn't just look cool, but actually makes you work better. Um, we, we realize that everybody's unique and we create spaces that are unique to suit you. Yeah, and luckily I've been able to work with James on a few projects with different companies, and he actually managed Capital Factory's recent expansion onto the fifth floor. Um, and so if you haven't had a chance to go down there, it looks really awesome, I like it. <laughs> so um, again, I was like, tour this space and the fifth floor, because I'm just a huge fan of Capital Factory, and of course what they do for startups and um, you know really helping them grow. Well, before we get started with some questions, I want to show a little video about a, a customer who was in a similar position. They were a startup, they were experiencing growth, and they took some steps, and um, you'll see what they did to kind of get started in their new space. We met at Art Center when I went to school. I came around the corner, and there was like fireworks. I think she always wanted to start a business of her own. I wanted to take my art career and do something with it which would allow me to reach out to more people other than just a piece of work in a gallery. I started with this handbag, couldn't sew, but put it together and found someone to stitch it for me. And then I had to look for how to have it manufactured. That's kind of how I got involved with it as a concerned boyfriend to find the manufacturers and the factories. I was doing it for my clients at the time. So as I got projects in, I would help pay for stuff. And then it kind of rolled into a business which just kept going. We started on the early handbags in 2003. Then eventually they turned into a product line and then we started getting them into boutiques. Our first apartment was our first office. I want to really take my industrial design firm out of that department because it's just too big. We needed room for our factory, but we also needed traditional office spaces. We had a realtor that we knew. He said, I think there's a great listing and it's right around the corner from your house. <laughs> Why don't you guys take a look? And we walked in and Joel immediately could see the potential. We realized that it's just this big space back here. We just kind of looked at each other and, and it was just like, yeah, this I is think it. this is it. We had a dream of how we wanted the space to look finished. When we moved into the space, we brought our old chairs. We just grabbed whatever we could grab. One weekend I was on HermanMiller.com just kind of dreaming. 
I noticed it's little, but it's a small business. The small and medium business program for Herman Miller is an essential tool for customers that are looking for infrastructure in their new spaces. Ona and Joel were interested in designing their new studio. I went into the meeting completely close-minded. We just spent money on the building. It's expensive, forget it. And he's showing us all these beautiful things he's gonna leave and I can't have it. Jesse came in and he said, I could sell you a bunch of furniture, but really, what is it that you need? Herman Miller sent your team and with us figured out the planning of the space. Joel works on a lot of design-oriented applications. Ona has a lot of tangible products. You have to be very keen on understanding the intricacies of every organization. Otherwise, you're just selling chairs to people. It was so exciting when the truck arrived and made the delivery. I thought that that would be it, but then 10 minutes later, Jesse walks in the door again, and he's like, okay, let me show you how these work. We really do care about what our customers are doing. We hope that they are the next Fortune 500 companies of the world. And we'll never know that if we don't take care of them. One of the things that the financing allowed us to do was instead of getting two pieces or this area, actually getting everything and having that look at once. And that's what we needed to get the furniture in here so that people can be comfortable and we can get to work. Without making one bag, there's a bigger picture. If everyone on the team can't be happy and comfortable, then we will all be more productive. started with some questions that I think all of us have come across as being the most widely asked questions by startups and small businesses. So I think, you know, going back to the video, they mentioned, we realized we were growing. So we reached out to a friend who happened to be in real estate. A lot of startups and small businesses don't immediately have those contacts. So my question to both of you is, if you want to contact a broker or you know an architect and designer, what's the easiest way to do that? How do you find a contact? We'll start with. Yeah, sure. Um, I think a lot of times the way I get in touch with people is they, you know, reach out to another friend that's leased off a space and say, "Who did you use? Did you have a good experience?" Um, and so usually it's kind of a referral of having a good experience with the broker, and then them reaching out to me and me going meet with them, tell them our process, and explaining kind of what we do. Um, you know, also looking on Google and researching different commercial real estate firms here in Austin, I think what's important is finding someone that specializes in the product type of office space. Um, not everyone can do commercial, residential, retail, you know, you can't be really all things. You really need to specialize, I think, to be an expert in the office commercial space. Totally agree. Um, People find architects the same way. You know, you, you look at somebody's space, say, oh, that looks really cool, who did your space? Or what happens a lot of time uh, is that the building that you're moving into has some architects on, that they work with because it manages their space for them. And so they'll say, oh, just use this architect. And it's like any other business decision. You, you have to do your due diligence. Uh, just because somebody recommended somebody doesn't necessarily make them the right choice, especially in that situation. Their relationship they're, that they're trying to manage is with the building. It's not with you as a new tenant or as a new client, rather. Um, and so what we say is, is look around, find the people that are going to work with you to create the space that's for you and make sure that, that who they are is somebody you want to work with and have fun with because you're going to spend a ton of time with that person and your broker too. While you're doing this, it's not, it's not a you know, a one-off meeting. This is somebody you're gonna be working with intimately for months. And if you don't like that person, or they're <laughs> not trying to manage your relationship, <laughs> it's not gonna work out. And so, um, you know, ask lots of people, find out lots of information. Don't just go with that first recommendation that comes your way. Okay. Yeah. And you both touched on, you can't be all things 
you know, for every customer. Mm -hmm. So what would you say are the qualities that maybe each of you possess because you specialize in working sometimes with smaller customers? What are those qualities that somebody can watch out for and really make sure that their broker or, or architect has? Yeah, I think, um, you know, giving you guys knowledge of what's going on in the market. So meeting with them, hopefully they'll, you know, provide you with knowledge of what new construction is going on. Who's leasing space here in Austin? You know, like providing that expert knowledge. Um, what rates are doing here in Austin? Um, if they don't have that, they're not in the market every day. Um, they're not doing deals. And I think that's super important because you want someone that's an expert and that's um, knows what's going on in the market, has those relationships with the brokers and the landlords because that's going to get you spaces that you might not know about um, otherwise. Um, I think someone you trust, you need to feel comfortable with them and trust them because they're advocating on your behalf and your company and those are big financial goals and big financial commitments that you're going to make um, with that space. So somebody you trust um, and then someone you enjoy, I think that's super important to have that relationship. The way I look at my business, my clients, it's not a one transaction, it's a relationship that I want to have the whole time I'm in this business, which is for a very, very long time. And so, um, you know, someone that you enjoy to work with and hopefully we'll have that relationship with for a very long time. Yeah, um, you know, we, we pride ourselves at 80% of our business is repeat and referral because it is all about relationships. It's about developing trust with people that you're going to provide the services that they need. You're going to create the space that makes them better at what they do. And uh, as a small firm that focuses on commercial time fit out, that's all we do. And it's not about creating a design that reflects us and our style and our you know, glorifies ourselves. It's creating a space that makes you work better. And because we're smaller, because we we uh, have the flexibility to say this is the most important thing we're doing, we can reallocate staff to wherever it needs to be and make sure that everybody's getting the service that they need. Uh, and I think those are the things to look for, especially the, the point about, we hear it a lot, I won't name names, but they design for the picture, the, a company that's designing to make the space look really cool. And then they walk away and you, you move in and it doesn't function the way it needs to. Uh, and that's really, you know, you're in that space for five, seven, seven, 10 years and it doesn't work and now you're stuck because you've all allocated a huge amount of money to this and time. Uh, so make sure that, that who you're working with is somebody that's gonna make sure that what you get reflects them and helps you be better and continue to grow. Yeah, and I know we talked about like Austin can be a challenging market to maybe even find real estate, et cetera. And I wanted to uh, have you talk about um, Haley some of the maybe parking needs, how you accommodate those, and maybe frustrations yeah, that can go along with that. Sure. Uh, parking is a huge issue in Austin. So downtown especially right now, an unreserved spot per month is $185 um, per space. So that can add several dollars per square foot onto a company's um, dollar per square foot monthly cost. It's outrageous. Um, and we're seeing that those are just going to keep going up. I've heard a lot of landlords say that they think that it'll hit 200 by the end of the year for an unreserved space. Um, so it, that's really tough. And then the density that tech groups are really trying to achieve within a small space is another challenge with parking because these buildings downtown and really the Northwest and Southwest don't accommodate that ratio. Um, so what I've seen is I've seen groups give employees an allowance. So they'll give their employee a $70 allowance a month. So they're not paying that 185, but they're giving that employee 70 bucks. That employee can then either keep that $70 and take the bus, ride the bike, have someone drop them off, or they can use that money to pay for a spot themselves. So they're kind of having to put some skin in the game, find a space not in that garage because it, it's not going to allow for that many people in a space um, to have it, but they'll have to find a parking um, space somewhere else. So it's really given, you know, the ability of tech groups to still lease space downtown and have employees have parking, um, but you know, still meet that need of parking as well. Yeah, and parking is of course one of the challenges that I think small businesses and startups face. Um, but would you both maybe give some insight into some of the other challenges you think a lot of startups face when they're trying to look for a space? Sure. You go first. All right. Um, 
The other two challenges I would say is finding a short-term lease. So um, a lot of startups in my experience have wanted you know, a space for a year or six months, maybe two years. Um, and most landlords here in town are looking for three to five years. So um, just finding a space that meets those short terms, whether it be a co-working space, uh, subleasing, um, but having a broker that knows the landlords in town and brokers that are willing to do a short term is really important. It'll save you a bunch of time of not wasting time touring spaces that aren't even gonna meet those needs. Um, and then the other thing I think is securing a lease. So most landlords in town wanna to see at least the past two years of profit and loss and balance sheets. Most drives aren't gonna have those types of financials in my experience. Um, and so again, having someone advocating on your behalf, getting creative, whether it be pay several months rent up front to secure that lease or having a larger security deposit. There are ways to do, you know, to secure the lease and to make the landlord feel comfortable with you guys leasing space for a shorter term. Um, but it's it's having someone that kind of knows that landlord and broker and, and has that relationship to kind of get creative because in the end you are competing for that space. In a market like this, it's less than 7% vacancy downtown. There's more than one person looking at space at all times. So the landlord kind of can look at those financials and be like, who's going to secure this lease better? So it's important that you have someone that can get creative and really help you guys get that space. Oh, uh, for us, I think it's the fact that for a lot of startups, the first time they're they're moving into an office uh, with a plan. You know, <clears throat> everything else has sort of been done ad hoc. You, you get some space, you start growing, you're buying furniture just as you need it, and everything sort of just grows and there's no plan. And so to us, the biggest challenge with working startups is taking the time at the very beginning to help you understand who you are, what you're looking for, uh, you know, aesthetics, uh, culture, those because all of those need to be reflected in the space that you create. Uh, and so the programming process, which is the first step, where we get to learn all about you, we help you understand uh, and verbalize those things, which you maybe know internally, uh, is really the, the big first step and the big challenge to this. Uh, understanding cost, understanding you know, what, is it, what does it really mean? How much is it going to cost to create space? Uh, especially in the market right now, with so much construction going on, it's very difficult uh, to get work done cheaply because you're basically competing with everybody else who's spending lots of money for the GC's time, for the sub, their subcontractor's time. Uh, and so really, really walking in the door with a good understanding of what you're going to get for the dollars that you spend and then figuring out the way to spend those dollars creatively to get the most back to the And I think um, a lot of people just assume that there's kind of at least one step process for maybe involving a broker and then you bring design on, et cetera. James, can you shed some light on maybe the normal process that you've gone through or if you've been involved first with some startups? Absolutely. Um, I think you can, Certainly do it either way, hire the broker first, hire the architect first. In my personal opinion, the best thing to do is get them both involved as early as possible because we really can work together as a team. Uh, help by doing that programming, we can get a good sense of the actual space that you need to make sure that your broker's looking for the right space to see to see you. Uh, you know, I know that y'all use some some sort of standard ratios to determine square footage, but we can look and say, oh no, they really need more or less, they're gonna be denser than that. And so they're finding the right space, um, location, all those things. We can go look at spaces with the brokers, with you. Uh, and so starting that process together as early as possible, I think is really a big key point. Yeah. And as far as budgeting, I mean, do you both maybe sometimes give advice to some startups and small businesses as far as what to look for, um, price per square foot, et cetera? How do you all influence a startup's budget? Yeah, uh, I think educating. Um, so like the average square foot cost downtown is $43.50 a square foot. It's outrageous. So I think having a budget is everything to really know what you're doing because otherwise you can waste a ton of time, lose a lot of opportunities on spaces because things move so quickly here. Um, so really sitting down and kind of figuring out what your financials are going to look like and what you want to spend and, and um, Kind of figuring that out with your broker is really important before going out and looking at space that might not meet your goals. Yeah, and the same thing is true from our side as well. Um, understanding what construction costs are, 
uh, the fifth floor, we were, we were able to get down to forty dollars a square foot because we basically didn't didn't move any of the walls. We took down some, but it was it was already built space that we were able to just refurbish. Uh, versus when we did this floor, it was empty. It was cold dark shell or warm dark shell, uh, which means it had air conditioning but no lighting, and it was empty. And so this was one hundred twenty dollars a square foot to do what you see here. Um, and so it can it can vary widely depending on the space you move into. And so again, knowing that budget up front or understanding what you think you want to spend, mm -hmm. we can as a team help determine where you want to look. Because if you if you're looking at cold dark shell space, but you don't have the money to finish that out, yeah, you know it's not going to work out. So um, we can absolutely sit down and try to figure figure out uh, where to allocate funds. <laughs> again, empty space is cheaper to build than lots of walls, yeah. but then you're spending on furniture. So we can help you figure out what that budget should be and make sure that you've accounted for furniture, equipment, um, plumbing, everything that goes into a space uh, and just help you understand what that all means, mechanical, electrical, uh, and those costs can vary per building to building. And their building, Perry Brooks building across the street, uh, is a very old building and mechanical systems completely tapped out. So tech companies, that, if a tech company were to move in there, the density they require actually costs lots of money because they actually upgrade the mechanical and electrical system <laughs> the entire building to handle their one lease. Um, and so again, knowing that stuff up front, we can maybe avoid that kind of space mm -hmm. and puts you in the right space that you need to be. Yeah, and then speaking of being in the right space, um, I know tech is a really hot industry here, um, as well as creative. Where are you seeing most startups and small businesses open an office. We talk a lot about downtown, but are there other areas that you're seeing a boom? Yeah, um, sure. So I would say, in my experience, um, the most important things for startups is hiring great talent and then retaining that talent. And um, what goes into that is competition, right? Who, will, who are you competing with to get that talent? And a lot of times they want to be downtown that talent are millennials that want to be in the energy they want to be able to walk and get something to eat they want to be able to go to cool bars you know walk maybe they live downtown maybe they want to walk to work um, so we're seeing a ton of people move downtown um, however um, I recently actually just put a startup um, and a sublease out in B caves in Southwest um, because that gave us the short term that he was looking for so he's in there only for a year um, and then, you know, a lot of times what we'll do is from there, he's had a year on his feet, you know, and now he's ready to move downtown or wherever it really meets their goals. So a lot of times they'll start out in Northwest or Southwest. Northwest actually is cheaper than the Southwest market. Um, not by much, but uh, so we'll a lot of times see like a sublease or, you know, a shorter term lease in those areas and then they'll move downtown once they kind of know what their goals are after a year because a lot of times they're not really sure of the future. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it depends on the size. You see a lot of really small companies, I think, taking that approach, mm -hmm. whereas the more established firms um, want to be downtown. We're seeing stuff in East Austin as well, of course, because that's sort of the, the new trend. Which is just as expensive yeah. as right. downtown. A right. lot of people think it'll be cheaper. And so you're like, I'm sorry, I yeah. wish I could lower the price more for you. Um, and then you talked about with budgeting, um, James, you talked about like budgeting for furniture. And of course, I mean, I know that's where we're brought in all the time. Um, but you mentioned you get a lot of questions about, um, oh, well, I have my Ikea furniture. I think I'm just going to bring that in. I don't know. What do you think about that? It's understandable. I mean, it's cheap. You know, you can buy a table for $79 or something like that. But the reality is it's designed to be in your house. You're going to be supposed to use it 30 minutes a day. It's not designed for a person to sit in front of it for eight, nine, 12 hours a day. And over time, you're going to end up replacing those tables you know, over the course of the year. If you have 100 desks, you're going to replace probably five of them every year. And so that savings that you think you garnered um, can sometimes be lost really quickly. They also don't have cable management, so you end up with your space looking really sort of junky. Um, and there's lots of companies now that that have realized that startups are, are a really hot market for furniture. And so they're introducing commercial grade furniture, which is um, yeah. explain what that is real quick. Well, and I mean, with commercial grade furniture, I think, you know, we look at a space like Capital Factory and like the workstations that they're using are meant to stand up for long use. Um, I know with all of our product, it is specifically to be three shift warranty 
involved. So we imagine it's possible, especially in some place like a call center, you could have somebody at that desk from midnight to midnight. And we carry the type of warranty that would support that. So if it ever breaks down, I mean, we'd be right there kind of fixing everything for free. And I think a lot of times, like James mentioned, the IKEA stuff can go bad really fast. And so having that commercial grade, I think it is a huge asset. That's my favorite. I'm like, <laughs> I'm <laughs> centered too. Um, that's a good point about the warranty, because another big temptation is to buy yourself on the internet, right? I mean, they find knockoffs of these chairs, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. But there's no warranty when it breaks you're out of chair. I mean, there's no way to get parts for it. There's no way to fix it. You're just throwing that chair in the trash. Can. And so, um, again, I mean, there are times where companies that definitely the only option they had if, to have people sitting in chairs and the desks was to look at those avenues. But it's, you know, we always recommend uh, exploring the other options first because longer term, it just pays for itself. Uh, and other things, I mean, furniture, furniture depreciates over five years. So, you know, if you're planning, as everybody I think is, to be in your space longer term, after five years, it's, it's a zero cost on your, on, your, uh, on your balance sheet. And so, you know, even though the upfront may be a little bit more, it pays for itself. Yeah. And I think, you know, we've talked a lot about um, different issues that startups face. Um, can you guys, I mean, before we turn it over to the audience, are there any last maybe hints or tips or something that you give to startups? <laughs> I would say um, just, I would say hire a broker for that. It takes a ton of time. That's why it's my full-time job is uh, it's a process and um, it'll save you time and money in the end um, and give you further protection in your lease. Um, landlords in town, the majority of them have a, a representative for their building um, and so you should be represented as well there's a total of six percent that's split between the landlord's broker and the tenant's broker so I receive four percent as a tenant rep broker of the gross lease and the landlord's broker receives two if I'm not involved and you don't have someone representing you um, the landlord's broker receives four percent so not only are they incentivized to go direct so that they make a higher fee but their, their allegiance is with the landlord, so they're going to make sure the landlord meets their goals as far as what rate and not giving you different flexibility within your lease. Um, so I would just say, you know, really consider that um, as a way to protect your firm. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, look at those relationships because, again, the same thing happens with, with those architects that work for the building. That's where their allegiance lies. Uh, whereas we want to be your advocate, your architect should be your advocate because this isn't something you do every day. Uh, and so you should find the experts who do it and take full advantage of that. I mean, you certainly wouldn't you know, go to the guy down the street for your banking. Uh, you do your due diligence and, and take the time, make sure you hire people that you wanna work with over and over again and uh, build those relationships because that's what's, that's what's gonna carry you uh, in doing this, yeah. Well, with that, I know I don't want to keep everyone too long, but um, do you have any questions that I mean, we have these great panelists in front of us? Do you have any questions you want to ask them? Yes, sir. Upfront costs with the architect. I mean, I kind of know the uh, commercial real estate brokerage compensation. Yes, sir. But as far as the architect, what is expected in pursuit costs with you? Before engagement. Uh, so what we'll generally do um, is our fees are generally eight to twelve percent of your construction costs is where it'll end up being. Uh, it it sort of depends on on the size of the space uh, and what you're trying to and the complexity of what you're trying to do. Uh, we'll write a contract and we bill on a percent completion basis. So as we work our way through the process. Uh, you're getting billed for the time that we're spending. There's no upfront, uh, you know, you don't put a deposit or retainer or anything like that down. Uh, a lot of clients will write an RFP where they get proposals from multiple architects, uh, you know, ask for qualifications, go through that. Um, and so, you know, the, the with other startups in the past, we've done things like weigh the programming costs, uh, understanding that people are, you know, sometimes cash strapped. Uh, I think it just sort of depends on uh, 
on the client and the relationship. But um, in general, you're not gonna be out of pocket until the process is started. Sir, how do you really uh, determine the layout of the space? I mean, I go into a space and I say, I've got four employees now, I may have eight over a couple of years, I really need four offices in an open space. Sure. How do you well, get more detail than that? So we'll go through in our programming process, we'll try to understand what are they gonna do in that office? How many hours a day are they in the office? Same thing with the with the people in the open space. Are they at their desk all the time? Are they up walking around? Uh, do you need some collaborative space for them as well? Um, and really try to work through what each person's, especially with a small company like that, what's each person's day really look like to allocate uh, space? I mean, for larger companies, if somebody's in the office less than 20%, you know, we'll say maybe they should have a hoteling station where they come and touch down and it's not assigned to them. Anybody can sit down at that space. Uh, but really, we, we try to work through what those uses are. If you're in your private office and you're having meetings all day, we need to make sure that it's big enough for your desk plus a small conference room or at least a comfortable area where you can have a meeting. Uh, if you're just heads down, your space can be a lot smaller, of course. So we just try to work through those things. Now, the, the growth side of it, uh, is a, is a real tough question because especially with startups that are expanding as quickly as they are, um, it's always a question: Do you lease empty space and just you know you're paying more up front, knowing that you're going to take over take it over relatively quickly, or you know work with your broker to get right of first refusal for expansion space or uh, potentially sublease some space that you take it and occupy it so you furnish it and then sublease it to somebody else. Um, and again, that's a, that's a real good reason to have the broker and architect team on board early because we can work through those things with you up front. For us, uh, just to throw on the programming process usually takes between two to four weeks because we really do want to get as in-depth as possible in who you are, how you work, and understand everything about that so we can create that space that really reflects who you are. And then oftentimes, I think that is sometimes when um, I work best with James too, when we have maybe a general floor plate and he wants to come and say, you know, what kind of solutions do you have to fit this kind of work? Because we have somebody who is going to be in a hoteling um, type of station. They're not going to be there all the time. Is there a way that we can maximize the amount of space so that we're not devoting a lot of space to that one employee, et cetera. Um, so I think that's why I'm kind of glad that all three of us are here. There is a really fine balance in our relationship. We all work together in so many ways because I think when you get into that lease process, it gets really complicated really fast. And the last thing you want is, you know, a startup who I think startups just kind of hold a, a place in my heart. Like I just I just really feel for them. I think that they're incredible entrepreneurs. And the last thing I want is for them to come into the process and feel really, really overwhelmed and to be surprised by ridiculous costs. Um, so, like you said, I think it's really good to have that relationship and to really focus on programming um, mm -hmm. to see not what we want them to have, but what their true needs are. Okay. Do we have any more questions? So, is it time to do the drawing? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to go and grab that jar. And nobody had to leave early yet. Good. I mentioned how if you want to let everybody out a little early, I know Techstars is having an event too, and they're a few guests. So, did anyone not put their name here? It doesn't even have to be a business card. It can be your name, it can be. Are you sure? Okay. All right. Anybody? Are we all good? Okay. I think we're going to have one of my presenters draw. Ooh. Fancy. All right, it's Haley. Oh. <laughs> I, I was looking at you. <laughs> no, that's why it's All right, okay, draw the winner. Right. Michael Spain. All right. Awesome. Yay, great. Okay, well, the prize that we have for you is one of our Herman Miller Leatherbound notebooks. And I mentioned the Aaron share earlier. 
There's, um, you can look online and see people playing Aaron chair hockey. So it's, it's a little hockey puck and a $50 Whole Foods gift card. That was cool. Yeah, so thank you so much for coming. Yeah. And I know I have some business cards back there. And if you want some information about these two presenters, um, you can approach us now or, um, of course, just contact me and I can get you any, any information that you need to. But thank you so much for coming. Thank you all. Thank you all.